there, banditos. Welcome to another Wednesday episode of the Dollar Bin Bandits, where, as always, we just love to fling open them doors of your local comic book shop and talk to your favorite comic book creators of yesterday and today. But before we do any of that, let's introduce ourselves, shall we? I'm Joe Marcello. I'm Warren Phillips. And as always, let's be sure to thank our sponsor. Yeah, we're talking about our sponsor, Tomorrow's Publishing, who was just at Baltimore Comic Con showing all the latest books and magazines, projects coming up. Be sure to check out everything they have going on at tomorrows.com. That's T W O M O R O W S dot com. And now on with the show. Today's guest has been a professional colorist for over 30 years. He's worked on titles such as Superman, Flash, Justice Society, and Nexus, and many others. We're talking to none other than Glenn Whitmore. Um, I have to say, such a fun interview. Love talking about, uh, you know, color and the process and everything that goes into it. Uh, it's really interesting. I mean, we've talked to colorists before, and I, I have to say, they're an interesting bunch. Um, you know, how one gets to that point in their career seems to be, uh, seems like a bit of a deviation from what they had originally planned, but it's an interesting path nonetheless and an interesting interview. Yeah, I was uh, lucky enough to meet Glenn at, at the con and at Terrific Con. Uh, wonderful guy. And I mean, you think about the Superman issues he colored were sort of the biggest events in Superman's uh, history. And Glenn was part of that, and his coloring is what brought it to life. Um, so being able to talk to him was was such a joy. We'd love to have him back. And without any further ado, here's our interview with Glenn Whitmore. How are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start the same way we do with everyone, and that is, how did you get into comics? Well, Batman 66 and uh, the filmation... Uh, superhero cartoons from the mid 60s were my gateway but you know, when i was a kid they were reruns locally on channel 11 in new york so you know, i was born in 66 so i kind of missed them the first time around but uh you know by the time i was in kindergarten first grade you know that was my gateway into uh into uh into comics and dc comics and you know begging my mother to to uh buy buy batman off the stands and uh because i was mainly into batman at first and then the rest of the dcu you know i wasn't much of a marvel guy until 14 about when i turned 14 but that was you know a while later so but uh yeah so that's how i got started that's uh so and how go. did you uh how did you start your your way into the business um well uh well i i had been drawing for most of my life um and my and i took uh, i took drawing lessons at the joe kubert school which is actually 15 minutes down the road from where i live okay. So I got to I got to go there for Saturday morning classes, and that sort of nurtured my 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 drive and my passion to to be part of the whole comics thing. And then I went to the school full time. Um, and then um, my my first job, believe it or not, was I worked at a local newspaper, and they hired students part time out of the school to do color separations for daily comic strips. And at that time, of course, most comic strips were just black and white daily, but they hi they would hire uh, students out of the school to, to do that. And that's kind of, that was like my first real entryway into um, a, some type of professional job where I understood how things really worked, you know, especially with color. Uh, you know, we would get the, in the editorial office, we would get the comic strips on a stat, black and white stat, and we'd attach uh, acetate overlays, uh, one to the one to the side, one to the top, one to the the other side, and mark them uh, yellow, magenta, cyan, and that's kind of like that. Was one of my first lessons in the business was um, 
that the three primary colors were not red, yellow, and blue. They were magenta, yellow, and cyan. So, and uh, from there, it just, it all started from there. So, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, a fellow, uh, a fellow student that was in the editorial department said to me one day, why don't you take your pages up to DC Comics and try to get work as a colorist? And I, I said, oh, okay. And the light bulb went on. And later that summer in 1987, I would uh, take my pages up to, uh, I took my pages up to uh, DC and Bob Rosakis, uh, uh, who was a longtime writer with DC and he'd been the production, became the, produ the production uh, department guy. Uh, would look at my stuff and he said, well, you know, it's not really good enough. And I'd say, well, can I, can I practice on some pages? Do you have some uh, pages? And he'd give me pages. I take them home. And two weeks later, I'd go back into New York city into the offices at DC. And he said, you're getting better. You're getting better. better. And then finally uh, he said, you're good enough. Uh, just, it's just a matter of, uh, it's just a matter of uh, calling us to see if we've got work for you on a regular basis. And that's what I did. And uh, eventually I wound up with the Hawk and the Dove, the one that uh, Rob Liefeld uh, drew the mini series. So, so that's the, the reader's digest version. Of it, I guess. <laughs> so hopefully that wasn't, well, yeah. <laughs> well, when you get to DC, who were some of the people, was there like a learning tree for you? Who were some of the folks that maybe you worked with who sort of, helped guide you and help teach you uh the ways well as i mentioned bob uh bob rosakis in the in the very beginning mm -hmm. uh most editors were were kind of hands off they were they weren't uh they weren't too picky you know as long as it all made sense and it was kind of easy work um but mike carlin definitely when i got on board on with Hawk and Dove and Superman later on, later on, he definitely had his, his tastes and, you know, he, I mean, he, he was trained under shooter at Marvel. So like he had that strong editorial hand on what he wanted, what he thought worked and what didn't he passed on to me. So like I would turn something in and something wouldn't, if if anybody would speak up about what he didn't like, it was it was Mike, you know, and Mike's the editor. That's that's the, you know, he's responsible for turning the book out. So, so I and I kind of learned learned uh, under him. Really, he was the only the only one, you know. Every once in a while, uh, through Carlin, you'd hear something from Ordway or Jerry Ordway or uh, Brett Breeding or somebody, you know don't do this or stay away from that, things like that. And uh, so that's, that's basically the guidance that I got once I broke into, into DC. So. With the uh, DC with the, cause we all seen photos and heard about the DC style guide. Um, yeah. How close as an artist, did you have to stick with what was in the guide or did you have some parameters that you can play around with a little bit? Um, I had no parameter parameters as far as, I mean, my, my job, I, as I saw it was get the costume, right. Um, and I pretty much, I wasn't given the style guide. Um, I mean, I pretty much knew reading the comics, what the colors were for all the, the characters. Um, I do remember one time very early on, I kind of lobbied. And I was kind of naive at the time. I kind of lobbied, you know, you know, on Superman's cape, you have the the solid yellow on the on the S on his cape, right? right. And I thought it would look cool to to do the S like it was on the front on the back, so that the negative yellow shapes would form the S. You know, I thought that was cool, and I tried that, and uh, but I was quickly. Um, <laughs> I was quickly told to correct that. So, but, you know, back then, like I had no idea of like, oh yeah, this is, this is according to a style guide. It's done a certain way consistently for, for all the characters. So. 
Yeah. You've, you've worked on a lot of different titles <clears throat> and you, you've been on some really amazing, like long runs. Um, but I wanted to ask about uh, some work you did on before Watchmen, which, you know, Watchmen in and of itself was just always held in high regard. And, you know, Alan Moore is always so picky about everything <laughs> when it comes to, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, comics and stuff. Do, when you worked on before Watchmen, what was your approach going into it? Did you feel like you had to kind of live up to anything that came before or were you given any guidance as to how to approach that? Well, the, the before Watchmen work I did was mainly through Steve Rude because he, he drew that dollar bill special. And I also colored a cover for the Minutemen, I guess uh, that's, and basically it was to, just to please Steve because like Steve, because um, basically Steve is the editor that you're trying to, you know, he's the guy that you got to get the the color approved with. You don't, you know, if Steve likes it, the editor probably likes it because, you know, Steve's a very strong uh, uh, personality, very strong, has a very strong idea. We all know how, how, how super talented he is and how, how just amazing he is, a, you know, he can do just about anything. So, you know, he's, he has that authority. And so whenever I color his, whenever I would color his work, it was, it was basically his way or the highway, you know, you know, which, which was unusual, which is unusual because I've worked on other books that I've been allowed to play a little bit or experiment with and everybody was fine with it. So. Another series that you worked on, which I think is one of the sort of hidden gems of the uh, early 90s, was the Justice Society books. Um, I really, you know, there were books that as a kid, I was kind of like, eh, but I reread them, you know, recently. I'm like, wow, like these were just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, memories of the uh, being on it. And how did you get the uh, the gig? Um. Well, I was coloring the flash for Brian Augustine at one point. And um, I knew I knew I wanted to color the Justice Society because they were my favorite characters, you know, and uh, just just loved them. I, you know, All Star in the 70s was my great my favorite title. You know, the Wally Wood run, Joe Staten. That was just like you know, I got every one of those. And so like the justice society meant a real, a whole lot to me. And I knew, I know there, there was that other mini series that had preceded it in like 90, 91. So I knew I wanted to be a part of it. And I put the word in Brian Augustine's ear and he, he was gracious enough to let me color that. And lo and behold, I got a really, a really great artist on, on the, on the title too, who, I, th who's one of my, to this day, one of, still one of my favorite artists I've ever worked over is Mike Parabek. Mm -hmm. I just loved his style, his, his simplicity, uh, you know, in it, in an age when image was starting to make its, uh, uh, make itself known and with its really hyper rendered comics on steroids type style to me, Mike's stuff was just a joy to work with for me, you know, and that was always, you know, that was always my, uh, my, my memory of it. Um, unfortunately, I never got to meet Mike because Mike passed away like sometime in the mid nineties. And I never, I never got to meet him. I just, uh, but, uh, but uh, I've really enjoyed his work. Mike Macklin was a great anchor on it too. So, so, and, and it hit the, it was just the right tone. It was fun. You know, you know, yeah, I, so I just had a blast with it. It's like one of my the feathers in my my cap that I I'm I'm really proud of. You know, I'm so glad you mentioned Mike Parabek's work in that because it's one of the times that I think the art and the story blended so perfectly. Like you said, it was a fun book. It it didn't take. I mean, there were some serious moments, but you know, yeah. you're looking at older characters. 
trying to figure out like are they still should they still be doing this and they still want to help out but they know that they've aged out a little bit and everything about that book to me clicked and you're coloring in it i mean it brought out i think his art so perfectly thank you i appreciate that yeah it was definitely i i kind of felt like i definitely felt as if the goal you know here was this group that had been in existence since the golden age and i and it, there was like a real um re i had a real reverence for it and uh, as well so so it was yeah <laughs> was it just one of the cases with that book that like you said you had image coming out there's a whole lot of number one issues floating around it was just the right book but at the wrong time as far as the market went oh oh yeah yeah i mean i remember i remember being in the halls at dc and and like mike carl i think it was mike carlin who don't hold me to this quote. It's like, like images, your, your superheroes, Marvel is your father's superheroes and DC's is your grandfather's superheroes. I think there was a, some kind of quote like that. And he, I think DC got like real, um, real self-conscious and felt, you know, so I had been turning issue like number three or number four, the, the color guides for, for that, for justice society, number three and that's when we got the word that it was going to be canceled with 10 so mm. and it was just you know it just it was just sad to see that there was no room for a book like that or it couldn't have continued on a little further you know mm. so. uh, hey, would... go ahead oh no 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 please go ahead i'm sorry no no but hey you know it's at least i got to work on it you know so i'm mm. thankful for that so You've worked on, like I mentioned earlier, so many great titles, and I would love to know, like, your process for working on these, because, you know, we have titles like Archie, or yeah. Archie and the verse of Predator, and which is just banana as, a, as it is, but like Green Lantern, uh, which I love the Circle of Fire series. Um, what is your pr approach when you go into these different characters? I mean, they clearly have different styles and artists, but you know like how do you approach these in such different ways well um i just try to make it as if i just try to color it as if the art the the penciler and the inker colored the colored it themselves like just to make it seamless you know i just always feel like color good color shouldn't really call too much attention to itself um or be too jarring uh so you know if if uh obviously if i'm coloring archie i'm doing very flat pastel -y and poppy colors you know uh i rarely use browns or, or i try to avoid using browns and grays in archie comics you know my my editor uh mike pellerito gave me the instruction to uh, make it look, make the Archie star stories look like candy, you know, for as the digest stories. But then, uh, but then like every once in a while, they would send me a, um, uh, a horror story and I would just have to throw, throw the book out the window and go real dark and gritty with the colors with that, you know? So it just depends on the genre. It depends on, the artist, um, you know, um, try not, to, I just try not to oversaturate, the, especially with digi digital now, try not to oversaturate the paper with color so that it's all muddy and, you know, just, you know, I, th I think comics should still pop, you know? <laughs> okay, I, I'm, yeah. I was gonna say, I'm glad you mentioned digital. Do you work in digital by any, at, at all, or is oh all... yes, absolutely, yeah. Well, I've been working in digital like uh, roughly 20 years now, because um, when my time at DC ended in 1999, 2000, um, everything was switching over to to digital, you know, uh, and I didn't know digital, 
And I was just getting my feet wet with it, but I didn't really know what to do with it or how to use it. And when I was busy coloring four Superman books a month, you know, there, there was no time to, to like figure that out and say, Oh, Hey, I'll color a book digitally because the, the time you spend coloring digitally rather than do guides is much more. So like I might spend three or four hours on a, on a page digitally, but it only take me 45 minutes to, to knock out a color guide. But, um, but so, somewhere along the line, they got the artist, they merged the art, the color artist, the colorist and the digital person together. And, you know, so that, you know, everything changes and you have to, you have to adapt. And uh, I, I mean, I love working digitally. I, I really do. You know, it's not not because, oh, I've got so m much more I can do with it, but now I can just make it look as clean as I really wanted it to be, you know? So if that makes any sense. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Now for, I know for Jonah, you are one of our favorite colorists. And I'm wondering... When in your career did you sort of feel confident that you're good at what you do or that this is where you belong? The decision you made to get into comics was the right one? Um, believe it or not, it came after I, I stopped working for DC and I had to get up to speed with the digital. I felt more confident with the digital stuff. I just felt like it gave me more of a chance to understand color theory and the printing of comics and how it worked a little bit, bit better. Um, one, another, another joy of my career that I really, I just want to mention is life, uh, life with Archie, which I colored between, uh, 2010 and 2014. And it was basically Archie, the married life, one half of the book. He had been married to Betty and the other, he had been married to Veronica. And, um, and that was, that was a joy to color. Cause I, I worked over Fernando Ruiz and the, and the, and Pat and Tim Kennedy for most of that series. And I really, I, I really, I really learned a lot when I was coloring digitally for that series. And, and, um, yeah, it was. So I hope that answers your question. No, definitely. So, uh, I have an Archie question, too. As yeah, sure. What do you think is the Archie magic that keeps generations of readers discovering the book or keeping with the book? Because, you know, it's not like there's multiverses and all this stuff in, in superhero comics. Archie, you know, it's... Uh, story about teenagers i know they take different adventures and different tones but what do you think yeah. is the magic that keeps archie going oh wow that's a that's a tough question um i think the archie characters are a little more relatable to the to the general public in, in general i think i mean and uh you know that's a that's a good question i wish i could wish I had a deep answer for that, but I, <laughs> I, I don't, I just, I mean, the thing about when I started working for Archie was I was thankful to get the work, but I wasn't really emotionally attached to Archie. Like I was with the DC and the superhero characters. And, um, I could just kind of like, just treat it as a job. Not that I didn't care about doing a good job, but I could just treat it a little more objectively as a as a job because sometimes sometimes you can care a little too much and overthink stuff and, and try to do something with it that you shouldn't. But the Archie stuff is just you know like I mean if you're talking about the the um, uh, the, the digest stuff. They're just very, the artwork is just very simple and clean and people can, uh, can really, uh, people can really relate to the characters and, and so, That's yeah. 
So, uh, as a fellow Superman fan, yes, as, uh, I, I have to ask, what was it like working on that title? You worked on quite a number of them, um, and yeah. you know, major major issues as well. Um, you know, what is that like for you being able to work on Superman of all characters? Oh, it was well, it, it was great. I was, it was, I was in awe. I just remember. I remember getting the gig and at first I was not um I was just supposed to be a fill in for a month but you know my car you know I popped my head in the office I was dropping off a job popped my head in Mike Carlin's office and he said oh we need a fill in for a month on Superman can you do it I said yeah sure and he says well you know if you work out you know, you can have the job, you know, regular, you know, I'm like, yeah. And, uh, I remember getting off the train and coming home to, uh, uh, cause I was still living at, with my parents at the time I was 22 and my parents had some doubts about me pursuing this, which I don't blame them, but yeah, I just remember walking in and they were eating dinner in the kitchen and just saying, Hey, they're giving me Superman and just feeling, feeling so, you know, feeling so proud. And it was great. It was great to work on Superman and be included in the, the Superman team summits. Um, um, I have so many, so many great memories of like going going out to California with the Superman team. And we went on to the set of Lois and Clark when they were starting that up and filming that. And we got to be extras. And then we went to the San Diego Comic-Con that year. And 93 was a time when everything was booming, you know, image. I mean, I remember being at the DC booth signing books and looking down down the aisle and there's the image booth and people are lined up for image and and they're lined up for marvel and it just just like it was it really was kind of a golden age you know <laughs> it was just you know um it it's it's fun to reminisce about how how the whole death of superman storyline got hatched and uh that's been talked about in, in books and, and documentaries and stuff about how, how they were going to, we'd been building up, to, or they, the writers had been building up to the, the wedding of Lois and Clark. And uh, we were told by Jeanette Kahn herself. I remember, I remember we, we got together at a super summit at the offices at DC. Jeanette walks in, says, I know this is really important to you, but you got to hold off on the wedding because we're doing this new TV show and we don't want it to, to, uh, you know, counter, uh, contradict, uh, the Lois and Clark TV show or TV show. They wanted everything to be in sync. So we all, all the writers and the artists looked at each other and like, well, what do we do now? Jerry Ordway says, well, we kill him, you know, and that's, and then Mike said, well, then, and then what happens, you know, usually it was a joke when we say, well, we'll just kill him, you know, but Mike's, uh, Mike's question started the, uh, started the ball rolling and it was great to be there to witness all these guys, guys and Louis Simonson to, throwing the ideas around and, and it was, it was great. So just to be part of that, that team, it, it was just, uh, I was in, you know, it was to be in awe and then to go to, and then um, sometimes that we would take a super summit at a low, at a hotel up in Tarrytown. There was this like really nice old hotel that they would uh, book us into. And I don't think it's sit there around anymore. and meet hard. I don't think it's there anymore. Oh wow! <laughs> the whole all those hotels and tar- side notes. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. who's listening? <laughs> They've uh, kind of redone, tore them down, and everything. Sorry. Yeah. 
so uh, so it you know so I was there I was there for 10 years I was there for 10 years on the books and I maybe got to go to like five or six summits total because some year later years inkers and the colorist weren't weren't uh invited but uh so did you ever want to and you know I a character like Superman is so I'm sure highly guarded in terms of what you can and cannot do with Superman. But did you ever, you know, want to perhaps tweak the color in such a way to perhaps fit a particular instance that you felt maybe would exude a emotion or feeling a little bit differently and, you know, you just weren't able to do so. Um, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, um, you know, I didn't get into like a emotional coloring until I started working with Steve Rude, thinking about emotional color that much. But I think the rule was if if the costume read, if it read, if the reader could identify the costume like i could do superman in a dark room so it would be like a dark purple blue and a dark dark burgundy red and so forth like as long as the co as long as it made sense to what was going on in the story that's all they they cared about um so but i had plenty of chances to do things like you know knock him out in yellows and oranges if he was like say flying near the sun or something or in in a room with fire or or whatever you know yeah, so yeah what so. was your thoughts when they said let's kill superman as as a fan and you know the idea of doing such a thing what was going through your head when this started to culminate i don't know it just it was just like i saw everybody else get excited and I just thought it was cool. I mean, the whole trope of killing off a superhero wasn't the newest thing. Mm -hmm. You know, superheroes get get killed and brought back any uh, all the time anyway. So to me, it was just another great storyline and excited to be part of it. I had no idea. I don't think any of, a, any of the Superman team had any idea of how it was going to take off uh, like it did as if you know the media treating it as if dc actually was going to go through with it for good you know it just i was sort of scratching my head there um but um you know, but uh, no i was uh, i i was okay i was okay with it i knew he was coming back i wasn't you know who who would why would dc kill off superman you know <laughs> <laughs> that's what i was thinking at the time like, so there's no nervousness at all that if fans revolt or if this thing doesn't hit just right people are going to be you know none too pleased with this group of uh writers and artists um not not on my part i didn't really think mm -hmm. that think that go that far with it mm -hmm. i just you know i knew mike carlin was pretty good at um making sure that the writers knew that this was that it had to be a good story you know mm -hmm. i think as long as it was a good story i think mm -hmm. mike was confident it would um go um i don't know if you were i or and i know you were at ithacon Mm -hmm. uh, a couple months ago that's where we met and i did a panel mm -hmm. i don't know if you were there for the panel i think i was still driving up when it happened oh okay well i was on a panel with roger stern and Ro roger did most of the talking because he was a writer but mm -hmm. uh, roger was saying roger said something uh, mike mike carlin turned to roger i think he said well you've been awfully quiet and roger said something like well, we be we better not mess this up, or no. something like that. So I think that's about the extent of it, you know. <laughs> but if you think about it, I mean, they they re they really pulled it off beautifully. I mean, the whole mm. 
you know, from late that whole year was just, you know, they really, they really did a great job putting those stories together. And uh, I was really blessed to be coloring it. So I would say when you saw the rough sketches of doomsday, what in your mind did you want to add to the character? Well, I pretty much just went with what they drew. You know, that was my job. That's how I saw my job was just the color, what they drew. I, you know, I didn't really have a lot of creative input into any of the storylines or the looks of the characters other than some, some of the new characters I would choose, choose colors for, you mm -hmm. know, like Doomsday. Um, obviously, obviously Superman's pri primary is red, yellow, blue. Mm -hmm. and there's that old Mort Weisinger rule of uh, of you know all the villains are either gold or purple or green so you know I try to stick with it. obviously the 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 pur purple wouldn't have worked well mm -hmm. like magenta purple for his pants and mm -hmm. gold would have been a little too bright so like that dark green I thought you know fit well and you know that was sort of like a hunter's green and mm -hmm. thinking back about it now it's like hunter's green was like a big color back in the 90s mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it just it just One occurred to me yeah so teal and hunter green and those kinds of colors so so hopefully that answers your question well, yeah good still wanted that ford explorer in the hunter green never had yeah <laughs> <laughs> I knew a family in my church that had that bought that and it was you know had had one so but anyway yeah. the day I finally got one they didn't have that color available <laughs> <laughs> at any rate um who are some of your favorite artists to work with that you just seem to gel with well um I th uh, think well Ordway I was uh, Jerry Ordway was, um, I was just thrilled beyond belief to be work, to be coloring his art because I had grown up with All-Star Squadron and him drawing All-Star Squadron and just thinking he was just like one of the most amazing artists ever at DC. And um, so, and he's always been very good to me too. He's like, Every once, a, you know, he in places here and there, he's recommended me for jobs and stuff, you know. Um, but he's always been very good to me. He he got me the gig coloring back issue, uh, back issue covers. Mm -hmm. I think Michael Yuri was looking for a colorist for a cover that he drew, and he suggested me. So so that's how that started. So Jerry, um, I would say, well, I love John Bogdanov stuff. Uh, um, I kind of felt like I was uh, coloring the Max Fleischer su Superman, the Golden Age Superman, because he had that 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 feel to it. So that that was, and Dennis Janky had some like really nice solid inks, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think any job that had really nice solid inks with nicely spotted black areas, I did better with, you know, uh, than, than having to, you know, like carry the weight and to make the, separate the forms more, you know, but uh, um, I'm trying to think, Mike Parabek, of course, I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I liked Stuart Immerman. Uh, I liked his stuff. Uh, so, but uh, all of them were pretty. All of them are pretty good. Like you know, uh, Jurgens and Breeding. Breeding had a like a really nice, solid, uh, uh, nice, solid, crisp uh, ink line. Uh, that was fun to work over. And uh, Ron Friends. Ron, you know. Who now I, I work with uh, I've worked with uh, over Blue Baron for sitcomics. Mm -hmm. uh, I 
you know, and Ron's been really good to me. I just saw Ron a few weeks back at Heroes Con and hung out, hung out with him a little bit and uh, just watching him knock out sketches at his table and just, but uh, I like, you know, so Ron friends, I would say him too. Ron's got that. He brought a little bit of that Marvel Kirby ish blockishness mm-hmm. back to Superman. So they all had their their individual styles, and you kind of had to play with them, but still keep things consistent. Because that's what why Mike kept me on board for so long was I knew what like like every every setting every set had its color, you know you know, color theme or whatever. So um, he, yeah, go ahead. When you're working with these artists and, you know, how important is it for you to have like a open communication with them? Because do you just know what they like and know what they are expecting you to do? Or is there a constant kind of conversation or back and forth about, you know, how to proceed with, you know, with the particular panels at hand? Well, I can say during the Superman and the DC days, the to me the editor the editor was the final say. So whatever whatever the editor wanted, that's what I did. I didn't really, I didn't I didn't really have a lot of contact with the other artists unless I had a question about something. Like I sometimes I would call such and such an artist like you know, what is this supposed to be or whatever. And just one time there there was an annual that John Paul Leon drew. Um and it had it's there was one scene was set in the Aleutian Islands. I'd never and uh, I couldn't there was no Wikipedia at the time. <laughs> I didn't know where the Aleutian Islands was and I knew but uh Louise Simonson had written a story, so I called her up and she says, Oh, it's up like up near Alaska or wherever. So oh, so lots of snow. I was like, Yep. I'm like, okay, good. So <laughs> so stuff like that. Reference questions I would I would uh I would uh talk to the other artists about that. I think nowadays it is more important because now it's more art it's more artist driven. You have to please because in order to get gigs these days, it's you, you, you connect with an artist. You don't. The editor does. The edit. It's not. It's not like the editor gives out the work anymore. It's like the the editor. The editor goes along with what the artist wants. You know. So if an artist wants me, the editor's fine with it. If, you know. So. Got it. Yeah. Are there any characters you haven't worked on yet that you would love to to work on? Hmm. Um, Not really. It's more, it's actually more artists that I I wish I'd rather work over, you know, that. So who's on your dream team? Oh, a dream team would, well, yeah, he's dead, but Alex Toth. You know? <laughs> I'm a big Alex Toth fan. Um, but uh, I like Chris Samney. He's got kind of like a Tothy black and white thing. I like Michael Cho, but he colors his own stuff. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but they're, um, I'm more of a fan of the artist than the character. I, you know, I'd rather I'd rather read a good eight page backup story that's got like great art story that and it could be it could be a fourth tier character, or, you know. As long as as long as the story and the art are good, that's you know I I kind of joke with myself sometimes. I say, Well, if DC rang me up and said, um we're gonna we're gonna send you all our romance comics from the '60s to to recolor. Like I would jump on that because I'd love I kind of like that 
kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care that I was on some wasn't on some prestige project. I'd I'd rather I'd rather color something that I really the art that I really really enjoyed. So. Mm -hmm. So before we go, I wanted to ask, where can fans check out your work? And are, do you have anything coming up that we can look out for? Um, let's see. Well, I'm I'm always in the Archie Digest, uh, my coloring. Um, if you want to catch me at, at a uh, convention, you can see my work there. I, I, I've got all kinds of prints and sketches for sale along with uh, with uh, my books. Um, uh, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm uh, uh, I'm on YouTube, but I, I had, don't do a lot of videos for YouTube, but uh, uh, I'm on Twitter. So I'm always posting like stuff that I've got up for sale. Uh, I'm doing commissions through CatskillComics.com, which uh, Scott Cress is my rep, and uh, he's 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 really good to work with. And uh, matter of fact, at Terrificon coming up in July, Me I either. will be grouped with uh, Ron Friends and Brett Breeding and other wow. Catskill Comics artists. Uh, my table will be grouped with there, so that's going to be great, you know. So. It'll mean I'll get up, get a steadier, a, a little steadier traffic. I think you know, because when I saw Ron this couple weekends ago, it just seemed like he was constantly being interrupted for to sign a book or something. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just laughing that you said that because I was finally I was thinking, well, I'm finally going to get him to sign my uh, Superman Blue comic that I oh yeah yeah I had everyone else who was on it and when we, i mentioned it to him when we interviewed him he was like oh okay I'm like really you don't want to say it <laughs> but we're definitely going to uh make sure that we check you out at uh terrific con because we will be yeah there. And, and i've got a few things li lined up i haven't started on them yet um uh one is i'm i'm lined up to do the next nexus story arc for steve rude i got to touch base with him about whether the pages are ready or not but uh, in the meantime i'm working on my own stuff here i'll just uh give you a quick look at one commission i did today cool. i i colored a sketch cover drawn by jerry ordway and i hope the guy doesn't mind me showing this but uh half I superman half clark kent that's, that's awesome. awesome thank you yeah and uh it was fun and so I'll be sending that off to my my agent uh, soon, and that'll go off to the happy customer. And if the customer, I hope the customer doesn't mind me giving you guys a quick look on that. So, no, it was me. No, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> but now that I know that you could do that, I'm gonna do that. I'm so, <laughs> so I do, I do color. I do both coloring commissions and drawing commissions because I I draw as well, and my you know, so if you like, as I say, the I bought the uh, the Earth Two Robin drawing you right. did yes. at uh, Ithacon, so that is going to have a prestigious place in the new and improved uh, studio. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's amazing. He's a fun character. He's a fun one to draw. Like uh, you know, whenever I yeah, see I... that costume or even the the other one that Neil Adams designed. I, I don't know. I like the adult Earth 2 Robin for some reason. So. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I texted my friends a picture of it, and they're like, yes, that's the one. Like, the, everyone, whenever they see it, there's a this reaction to it. Like, oh, my gosh, yeah, like, that's the one that uh, everyone sort of knows, you know, if they might not remember that they know it. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of see myself as someone who's carrying the banner for old silver bronze age you know golden age dc you know just mm -hmm. and um uh, at my uh at my convention table i like to use try to use as many primary colors as possible and with my prints you know make them bright and pop and everything i want 
I like I want people who approach my table to just see just to kind of feel like they've gone back to the spinner rack, you know, and they've mm. so that's 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 my mission statement, I guess. And we're back. Love talking to anyone who's worked on Superman over the years. I think we've we really should make a list and just check them all off because we've talked to so many big ones. We've talked to anyone and everyone involved Superman in some shape or form. Uh, and talking to Glenn was just an absolute pleasure. Uh, like Oren said earlier, he's worked on some pivotal moments in Superman history. Uh, Death of Superman and let's not forget Superman Blue, um, which I do generally enjoy. Uh, but it, it was fun. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview as much as we did. Yeah, and he brought up uh, Justice Society of America as one of his favorite projects. And I really highly recommend anyone, if you're going through the dollar bins, uh, the 1990s, early 90s uh, series of Justice Society of America. It's well written. It's fun. Um, of course, his coloring in it is beautiful. So make sure you go check it out. And as always, be sure to check out our social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, X. Is that still a thing? I don't know, but I think we're there. Um, but make sure you rate, review, subscribe, leave us some comments. We'd love to share what people think about us. We want to hear what you guys think. We'll read them on, on, on air. Uh, we'll comment, even if it's bad, we'll still comment. Uh, but we really would genuinely love to hear what you guys have to say. So please leave a comment and, uh, you know what to do. So without further ado, we'll see you guys next time.